introduce Tim for us. Tim Lyons uses a wide range of geochemical proxies to investigate environmental evo evolution on early Earth and its relationship with co-evolving co life, particularly as it relates to the rise of atmospheric oxygen. As you see from his title, he's actively applying the lessons learned from early Earth to the search for life on exoplanets through his affiliation with the NASA-funded UCR-led Alternative Earths team and the NASA Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments Research Coordination Network. Tim received his bachelor's degree in geological engineering from Colorado School of Mines, his master's degree in geology at the University of Arizona, and his PhD at Yale working with Bob Berner studying the exotic conditions in the modern Black Sea. So Tim is now a distinguished professor of biogeochemistry at UCR. And with that, I'm going to leave the floor open for Tim to present. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, so, uh, well, good morning from, from our side of the world. Good afternoon, evening, wherever you are. It's really a, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this series of so many wonderful speakers and talks. Uh, as, as Alex indicated, you can, well, you could tell from his introduction that my, my, um, career has taken some interesting turns and twists starting in geological engineering. And I did a dissertation um, working in the modern ocean. Uh, I think really with the express purpose of trying to develop an understanding of modern biogeochemical cycles so that I could explore um, those same cycles or analogous cycles perhaps in, in Earth's deep past. And so I really sort of serendipitously stumbled into the Black Sea, which we all know is the world's largest anoxic basin today. Um, and that's a rare condition on the planet today, but it's really the dominant condition of the ocean for most of Earth history. And so understanding not only the cycles within that basin, but the records of those cycles as recorded isotopically and elementally and molecularly in the sediments below has turned out to be a, a, a really lucky step um, in my career. And so that spawned uh, a, really a career long interest in trying to understand the evolution of our, of our deep time environments and, and the associated co-evolution of life. And it's been in the past, I would say six, seven years that my career has taken even a, a stranger turn in that I have uh, in, in a large group of people that I've been working with directing some of that knowledge, those lessons learned towards trying to help NASA find life beyond our own planet. And so I'll talk a fair amount about that today. I thought um, as the last talk in, in the series before it picks up again, it might be fun to get a little bit spacey in the way we think about things. And so I'm gonna spend as much time talking about um, the idea of life beyond earth and, and more specifically life beyond our own solar system, um, as much time or more time about that than I am about our, our own planet. But the, the guiding light through all of this is that the Earth has been really many different planets. We call them alternative Earths. And so what we decided as a team, as we were seeking funding and developing a strategy for this research, was that we could divide the Earth into you know, nearly an infinite number of different chapters, depending on how, how, uh, how high the resolution is of, of your analyses and the quality of your data, but certainly many, many, many chapters of, of Earth history that are all really very different. Uh, if you think about it, we've had a warming sun and a cooling interior, uh, perhaps an absence of continents or a near absence of continents, and then the emergence of continents and the emergence of plate tectonics, the shift fundamentally from a reducing to an oxidizing atmosphere, um, interactions amongst our continents, and, and against all of that backdrop, um, the emergence of life and, and the extraordinary evolution of life. And we refer to that often as the co-evolution because not only do, does environmental change drive changes in life, but changes in life drive uh, changes in the environment. And the best example of that that I can think of, and there are many examples, would be the emergence of oxygen, which comes from life. And think how fundamentally that has changed so many cycles, biological and abiological on our own planet. Um, so this Are We Alone is a theme that we and many other people focus on. And in our particular expertise, I would say as, as a team, is using Earth history to develop a catalog of, of Earth chapters and a catalog of, of archives of these different alternative Earths. 
And so those of you who follow astrobiology, and it's, it's certainly big in many places in the world, but it's probably no pl larger in, in emphasis and scope of, of research and, and largeness of teams focusing on, on this than in the US. Uh, the Astrobiology Institute celebrated its 20th anniversary not too long ago, and it has been actually replaced by something that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and in astrobiology within the NASA framework, and you could spin this many different ways, but within the NASA framework has really had four prim primary foci. Of course, we all know about the exciting re uh, Mars research. And of course, this is work that's happening all over the world through ESA and many other organizations. Uh, we have the Perseverance rover on, on Mars right now with the exciting possibility, inevitability, we hope of sample return. And then curiosity is still growing strong. And so there's a large investment of time um, and, and, um, and money, uh, human effort in the exploration of potential life on, on past Mars in particular. And then the icy worlds, which excite me uh, it, a, a great deal, um, and in particular Enceladus in Europa. Uh, we have the Dragonfly mission that was announced a couple of years ago, which will fly to Titan. Not so much for a search uh, for uh, extant life, but uh, uh, a, a deep dive into the conditions of what earlier Earth might have been like, and in particular, the large amount of organic material within the atmosphere. Titan is so cold that it actually has lakes of liquid ethane and methane. The Earth probably wasn't ever that cold, um, but certainly the kinds of organic reactions, photochemically driven reactions that Titan is experiencing today would have been like things that were happening in Earth's past. And so these icy worlds where we have vast amounts of water, Europa has more liquid water, um, near its surface, not at its, at its surface than Earth does. And, um, and it also has evidence for serpentinization-like reactions, hydro, uh, hydrogen fluxes, and Enceladus as well, hydrogen fluxes into those waters, uh, redox gradients caused by oxidation at the surface, and, and dynamic ice covers the outer ice cap that allows the juxtaposition of, of these oxidants through downward transport with reducing waters beneath. And so many of the things that we think about for not only generating life, but sustaining life through metabolisms. So stay tuned for that. Uh, there will be a great deal of research. I predict that we will soon go to Enceladus and there is already a plan through the Europa Clipper to orbit Europa and characterize the surface and the subsurface in far greater detail. Um, and, and then the two things that I know and care most about that I'm gonna speak about today uh, are the origins and, and evolution of life on our own planets. And, and, and so the co-evolution of the biotic and abiotic and how those help us with Mars research and, and water worlds or icy, icy worlds really, uh, ocean worlds, if you will. And then the thing that has really come into my, my uh, sphere of understanding and it's still nascent. Um, and for those of you who are early career, I say that if you can find something that's really different than anything you know about and figure out a way to do that later in your career, then by all means you should, because it keeps the excitement high and you always have some perspective to bring in because you're, because you're new to a field that may be dominated by people with different kinds of training. And so there's room for all of us in these, uh, in these communities. And I'm, I'm delighted to um, be calling myself increasingly an exoplanetary scientist. Um, so we're gonna operate on the two ends today uh, between the, the nature of our own planet, its evolution, in exoplanets. So I want to talk a little bit about exoplanets. All of you know about these. They've been in the, in the news a great deal. And one of the great things about, uh, about NASA and, and other agencies, of course, is the quality of artwork that comes out. This actually is, came from a colleague in, um, and, uh, and, and with, with NASA blessing. And, um, and so these are obviously, I'm going to show you a number of different artists' versions of what these worlds may look like. Um, so we're talking about extrasolar planets or exoplanets and, and specifically the idea of, of exploring for biosignatures on these planets. So the, the, the fundamental platform that you need to put yourself on as you think about this is that these are planets that are vast in number and vast in their distance from us, uh, light years away. Um, and so the likelihood of us ever visiting these planets is very, very, very low. Who knows what will happen in centuries and millennia and beyond. Um, but as we explore, as we approach this now, the idea is that the detection of biosignatures will all be remote. We won't be returning samples. We won't be doing in situ measurements. But in essence, what we're going to be doing and already starting to do is characterize their atmospheres. And so we're assessing a planet's life and its and its and its abiological processes and the interactions amongst those, primarily through the composition of its atmosphere. 
uh, with the likelihood or at least possibility that we'll also get data from reflection of the surface through pigments, for example, uh, albedo changing albedo effect on a rotating planet may be able to identify uh, the presence of continents that way. But it's, uh, you know, for those of us who work in the Precambrian, we know how hard it is relative to those who are working in much younger times. We'll take all of that challenge and multiply it by a number with a lot of zeros after it. And, and, that's, the, and, and that's the difficulty in working with exoplanets, but also the extraordinary fun, uh, because it, it demands uh, incredible creativity, I think, by people smarter than I to think about what we can do with these planets. And, it, uh, and, and, and all of the different challenges demand that we think in new and novel ways that can be informed by our own planets. Because let's face it, we are the planet N1 in our universe that we know of that has life. If we think of it as alternative Earths, then we have an N of many because we have been in essence many planets. So there are now actually about 4,400 confirmed exoplanets. Every time I give a talk, I have to update this slide. Back in, um, in May, when I was teaching my class in astrobiology, uh, I updated it to 4389. And then yesterday I did it and we're already up to 4400. You know, the way to think of this, and this is something that my colleague is really, uh, Stephen Kane has really driven into my head, is the idea that probably most stars that you see in our galaxy and imagine beyond our galaxy have planets around them. It's a natural consequence of the star formation process uh, in those disks that are around the, the, the nascent star, the protoplanetary disk as we refer to it. And so it's, it's reasonable to imagine that almost every star, if not all, have uh, one or many planets around. And so this number is really not limited by the scarcity of planets within the galaxy and beyond. It's limited by our ability to process vast amounts of data and go through the rigorous, uh, rigorous steps of what it is to confirm that a planet exact, uh, actually exists. And so there was a fire hose of data that came from the Kepler mission, which uh, just wound down recently. Kepler was, was extraordinary. If you look at a histogram of discovery of exoplanets starting in the 90s, moving toward the present, you see a huge spike associated with the, the Kepler discoveries. Kepler was looking at something like 150 or, or more thousand stars. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what you can do to detect those planets. But now we have the transiting exoplanet um, uh, survey satellite, which is, so these are our telescopes that are in space that minimize the effects of our atmosphere that can reduce our ability to detect planets. And so TESS now is, rather than looking at 150 some thousand, it's a bit more than that stars, it's, it's actually looking at the whole sky. And so massive amounts of, of planetary discovery will happen. And so now we're at the point of of not just identifying planets, but characterizing those planets, identifying planets that are terrestrial like our own within their habitable zones, which means they can have liquid water at the surface. And, and ultimately the key thing as we move forward is to develop a set of criteria for target selection for going to those planets through observation, not through visitation, to uh, spend time characterizing their atmospheres from an astrobiological standpoint, looking for biosignatures, but there are many other reasons to look at these planets, but my particular focus would be on the biology, potential biology of those planets as manifest with an atmospheric composition. Now, most of these planets have been discovered by transiting, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Most, many of you will, will know what this means already. This is an actual transit, it's a time-lapse, obviously, and it's within our own solar system. This is looking inward, and this is a Venus transit across, um, across our, 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 our own sun. And so we can actually now detect from the dimming of a star um, planets as small or smaller than Venus, which is almost exactly the same size as Earth. So while initially um, discoveries may have been limited to, to giant planets, gas giants in particular, we now can really detect with confidence things that are smaller, likely rocky terrestrial planets like our own. And so here's a Venus transit, and here are some actual data from a wonderful discovery that happened within the past couple of years, and that's the TRAPPIST system. Many of you would have heard of this. Um, it has their, it's a seven planet system, uh, and it's really packed around its star. So one of, the, one of the major areas of research within the TRAPPIST system is understanding the stability of the orbits of these, of these seven planets that are very close to the star. And so if you look at this figure here, this is relative brightness. So imagine that Kepler is just looking at, um, at the star, and, 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 and then periodically seeing dimming as one or more of the planets pass in front of that. 
um, star. And so one is 100% is brightness. And then you can see all these little dips coming down that are, are not huge, but they're big enough given the sensitivity, the remarkable technology of these telescopes to identify the planets. And so you can see the periodicity of the orbit of, of the planet around the star. And you can also through a statistical analysis and clever math start to understand that there are many different planets and get their periodicities as well and understand where they are relative to each other and how they interact and, and then ultimately identify uh, the presence of some of these planets, which is the case within their habitable zones. And we'll talk more about that. So the TRAPPIST system is one that's captured a lot of imagination, but it's just one of many, many things that we already know about and that you'll be hearing about uh, with, with higher frequency and detail in the coming years. So when a, when a, um, and there are other ways of detecting um, exoplanets uh, through the gravitational interaction of the planet and, 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 or planets and the star. Uh, because of those interactions, there are times where a star that we're observing actually is moving towards us and other times where it's moving away. And that movement towards or away, as all of you know from sound, can give rise to Doppler effects. And so you can get red or blue shifts. Uh, associated with those gravitational interactions, which identifies the planet and because it's gravitational also gives you information about the mass. So many planets have also been detected by a process called radial velocity. Um, there is also micro lensing, which actually has to do with the bending of light. So I, these, you know, we're, we are confident in these discoveries and confident in our ability to discover many, many more. And when I say we, it's really other people who do this. I'm more interested in interpreting these planets. So, uh, so here is a, a, a simulated a cartoon version of a, of a planet passing in front of the star. And again, it doesn't have to cover most of the star. The sensitivities of detection are strong enough that that we can just even detect sub-Earth sized planets. And um, the thing that I, I really wanna add through this slide is that I want you to realize that in addition to dimming the star uh, through this black circle that is the planet itself, there is a thin veneer of atmosphere around that planet. And some amount of the light that's coming from the star is passing through that atmosphere. Um, and so that, uh, opens the exciting possibility that we might be able to get atmospheric information. Now to put this into some perspective, and, and the Earth would be a characterizable and discoverable planet where we'd be looking at our, our planet from far away, including the atmospheric relationship. So the Earth is relevant in our discussion here. Look how thin our own atmosphere is, this thin blue line with the sun either rising or setting. I can't remember when I scavenged this from the internet. Um, but, but the atmospheric layer does not need to be vast there just needs to be enough light coming from the star, which there would be passing through that atmosphere so that we can do spectral determinations. And that's really what this is all about. It's about the interactions between lights across a, a swath of wavelengths from the ultraviolet to the, in the infrared and, and the relationship between reflectance, particularly from things on the surface, but absorption um, within particular wavelengths that are characteristic of particular gases. So I'm sure you all know a lot about or something about these spectroscopic characterizations of gases that we do throughout the, our galaxy and, and to characterize distant stars. And, and we have done this by testing, uh, testing our ideas by looking at our own planet with satellites uh, observing it. So there is a whole group of scientists who teach the earth, treat the modern earth as an exoplanet to sort of develop the sorts of techniques about what secrets does the earth give up if we were to be observing it today. Um, and, and actually that's the idea that our, my research, my, the group that I work in takes is that what if, what, imagine that you were looking at our planet, not just today uh, for the biosignatures that would be detectable present in our atmosphere like O2, um, and, and methane is very low, probably not detectable or barely, but certainly the O2 would be a wonderful biosignature. What we ask is how that relationship has changed over time. So imagine, put yourself in our seat, imagine that you're looking at our planet from a distant advanced world, I suppose, looking at our planet over the millions and billions of years of Earth history, imagining that the oceans are evolving from a prokaryotic world to a prokaryotic and eukaryotic world to a world with complex life as well. Think about the evolution of our own atmosphere and imagine as you can, the composition of that atmosphere. And What about that would be telling you what's going on in the oceans and, and other aqueous environments about the evolution of life. 
So it really distills down quite simply to the atmosphere being being the archive. That's that's the deliverable, characterizing that atmosphere, and then trying to imagine that giant black box beneath it that's through all the biotic and abiotic interactions giving rise to the atmosphere and its evolution. And so we can, of course, look through uh, these different wavelengths and, and, and identify the presence of different gases, which we are already doing and will with increasing strength, as I'll talk about later, uh, around, around exoplanets. And, and, and I also want to drive home this point that there are a lot of different wavelengths of relevance, depending on the gas that you're most interested in. You may have your own favorite biosignature, whether it's oxygen or methane. Those are two popular ones, nitrous oxide. There are other things that we can talk about. Um, and telescopes don't do all these things well. And so one of the primary things that we're doing as the next generation of space telescopes is being designed is trying to make a case for one gas or combination of gases over another um, would, that would be particularly relevant in looking for biosignatures on other planets and thereby helping to inform the design of those telescopes. Uh, whether we would like to have ultraviolet capabilities or others would say, let's work in the infrared or near infrared. Others would like to have a broad swath. Whenever you design a telescope, you're affecting the mirror design and many other parameters um, that, that would allow you to optimize for certain wavelengths over others. And so we are all sort of digging our heels in and saying, I wanna do ozone, I wanna do O2, I wanna do methane, I wanna do these things well. And, and so a group like ours that may not be designing telescopes can as biogeochemists say, here are the kinds of gases that we might detect, and here are the sorts of things that we might be able, to, that, that we might require to identify a gas as being specifically biological or not. Because another theme that will be throughout this talk is the idea that many of the biosignatures that we talk about have abiotic sources, and that's the challenge, the idea of these false positives, methane, O2, other gases can be generated through processes that don't require life. So it's not just about finding those gases and recognizing that they can be related to life, but actually trying to say uniquely for a given planet that they must be related to life. And that's very, very hard to do. So this habitable zone that I keep talking about is, is a distance from a, from a given star that is not necessarily, uh, the planet is not necessarily inhabited. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily have liquid water, but it's the right distance. It's not too close or too hot or, or too, too distant or too cold. It used to be called the Goldilocks zone because it's just right. And so it's the right distance from a star of a given, of, of a given brightness that it has the potential of having liquid water. And we can identify liquid water through reflection off the surface or the presence of, 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 of water vapor within the atmosphere. So identifying oceans on distant planets is not an insurmountable challenge. But here's one of the points that I really wanna drive home and it leads me into much of the rest of the talk is that the habitable zone, which all of you will have heard of before, again, defined by the, as the zone around a given star where a planet within that zone could have liquid water at the surface. And the search for life on distant planets really is about, uh, it's the, the idea of following liquid water. Even within our own system, own solar system, we think about past liquid water on the Martian surface. We think about sub ice liquid water in places like Europa and, and Enceladus. So liquid water is gonna be a constant theme in all of this and the habitable zone is the place where in theory there, there could or should be liquid water. But it also, and this is something that many people don't know, it carries with it the idea of that the atmospheric composition is also really incredibly important because of the, the role of greenhouse gases in, in retaining heat near the, the planet's surface. So the definition of the habitable zone going back a few decades actually includes some assumptions about the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about that for our own planet as well. So this alternative Earth team that, that I'm part of working with, uh, um, and I, I, I led over the past six years, working with, with colleagues spread out among five other institutions, in, including in many cases, former students of mine and former postdocs, uh, what we've been doing is exploring 4 billion years of persistent habitability in a dynamic early Earth to guide NASA's mission-specific search for life on distant worlds. It is an extraordinary thing to imagine that our planet, despite, as I said before, the brightening of our sun and the cooling of our interior, the changing of our atmospheric composition, including the presence, absence, 
changing abundances of greenhouse gases. Despite all of that dynamic behavior, we've had liquid water for probably 4.3 billion years at the surface. We've had oceans. And so how our planet does that is, is really a remarkable story. And trying to find other planets that might have done that is really the challenge here. Uh, it's not just about a snapshot of liquid water. It's about it's about having liquid water long enough that life could begin and develop a biosphere that would, would that ultimately express itself through detectable compositions of the atmosphere um, that, uh, that we could say um, with some confidence is an expression of life on that planet. And so the, the early earth is, um, which is really where we're gonna focus now. I know this is a Precambrian seminar, so I'm gonna talk a lot about early earth. The early earth is a remarkable story, as most of you know better than I. This is an, an illustrious group of Precambrian geologists. Rick Carlson published a nice review paper a few years back where he sort of challenged as and he wasn't the first to do this, this traditional Hadean view of the first half a billion years of earth history. Of course, the Hadean is named after Hades, imagining a hellish world. Um, the earth, the moon was, had already formed. The moon was close, closer to us than incredible tidal ranges. There would be an implication of that, but large and frequent impacts. Uh, the idea of having magma oceans at the surface, a very hot interior, um, a, probably a pretty hellish world in many people's minds where it would be difficult to imagine the beginnings and sustainability of life. But what many different recent studies, more recent studies have shown us is that the solid earth and, and the surface of the earth may have looked a, a lot more by 4.4, 4.3 billion years ago after the moon forming impact may have looked a lot more like today than, uh, than Hades. Uh, core formation was complete and this is based on a really interesting relationship of tungsten isotopes 182 to 184. Some of, some of you probably work on this system and so there is a pretty good level of confidence that the core formed very early on because it's related to the short-lived hafnium 182 and the presence of 182 in abundance greater than chondritic values in the in the mantle today implies that um, that core formation occurred very early which would have pulled siderophilic uh, tungstens towards the core uh, that it occurred very early so that hafnium could continue to decay generating 182 that we can can see today so we have pretty good confidence about this early formation and this has really important implications for the uh, composition of our atmosphere crust formation may have begun and this is one of the big questions i'll talk more about the atmosphere outgas surface temperatures must have been similar to those of today um, based on the assumed presence of liquid water um, which is really maybe the most remarkable thing. And that of course, as many of you will know, comes from really uh, wonderful, uh, a couple of decades worth of research of, of detrital zircons, most famously coming out of the Pilbara, dating back to 4.3 to 4.4 billion years ago, found in, in younger rocks, but they're detrital and can be dated with confidence by people like John Valley and, and many others have been, um, have been involved with this. And so the oxygen isotope compositions of these, of these zircons have been attributed with some confidence, I think, to the presence of a hydrosphere. Whether it was a vast ocean or not, we can debate, um, but the, the, the general consensus is that there were fairly large bodies of water um, going, uh, existing maybe, maybe 4.3 billion years ago. So it's, it's hard to imagine how that can be so. Remember that our sun has, is, is progressing through a known evolutionary pathway. And so that we know earliest in our history that it was only about 70% as bright as it is today. And here we are today, and that it will continue, continue to brighten. And our atmosphere is evolving in particular, the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in response to the brightening of this sun. Um, the silicate weathering feedback that I'll talk more about in a minute. But this idea that we had liquid water uh, when the sun was only 70% as bright as today requires a priori that we, did, that we invoke greenhouse gases. Um, and, the, and the two most commonly invoked greenhouse gases early in our history um, are CO2 and methane. Of course, CO2 is extremely important today. Methane plays a varyingly important role through Earth history and, and how that, that role has changed as many of you will know, factors into many of the discussions that would have occurred within this seminar series, including uh, the triggering of a snowball earth glaciation as methane destabilizes, et cetera, et cetera, at least ideas about that, et cetera. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the early atmosphere. Uh, we know almost nothing about it and very smart people like David Catling and Kevin Zonley and others are thinking about this uh, when they wake up until they go to sleep at night and I'm grateful for that. 
Um, and so this is something that Kevin Zonley published a few years ago. And the idea is that the early atmosphere was dominated by CO2 and N2 from volcanic degassing. Um, and that CO2 would be affected profoundly as it is today by silicate weathering, our natural thermostat, the reason really that we are here today, um, that there is this, this feedback that silicate weathering can consume carbon dioxide and that there's a temperature sensitivity to that. So when CO2 is high and, 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 uh, and the surface is warm, then this reaction is faster and it pulls down CO2 as a negative feedback to keep us within this range. As I tell my students, how remarkable is it that the Earth over this, this incredibly dynamic long history has stayed within a very narrow temperature range that's actually much less, as I say to them, um, than the temperature range between the freezer in your kitchen and the stovetop where you're boiling your water for tea each morning. And so we are very grateful for these greenhouse gases and the combination of biotic and abiotic processes and the feedbacks in particular, the interactions that have kept us a habitable planet for so long. And what is the likelihood that we'll find another one of these? We hope, we hope that likelihood is high. And so liquid water is a natural feedback associated with this. When it's warm enough, you put liquid water into the atmosphere, which is also a very important greenhouse gas. But one of the central themes in all of this is understanding the importance of methane, as I've said already, and something that I want to talk, talk more about. And so methane certainly has abiotic sources, and we all know that through reactions like serpentinization. There are uh, Barbara Sherwood Lawler and her team have worked on this for many, many years. And so in a nice review paper published a few years ago, uh, they, they, they talk about nine different abiotic pathways. I'm sure we can think of others, and I'll talk a, a, about some others. Um, but, uh, but so there are ways of getting methane into the atmosphere that can, can, can lead to warming. The concern from those that, for those of us who think abiologically that it also gives rise to a potential false positive. Um, so we can see methane, it'll be a delight to see methane in a distant atmosphere, but we know from this work that if other planets are behaving anything like our own, and we know that some of the icy moons are doing this, serpentinization reactions are certain on those planets, that, or those moons, and they certainly would be on other planets, that we can be generating things like methane through abiotic processes. So the false positive is the identification of a gas that could be related to life, but um, in, the, in, a, in this particular case is not, and we falsely identify it as a biosignatures. Um, so one of the themes that has come out in, in our studies is the idea that the biosignature potential of methane lies not so much with its presence, but with the inferred fluxes. How much methane must you be pulsing into the atmosphere or in a steady state sense putting into the atmosphere relative to those processes that are destroying it, um, such as photochemistry, the presence of oxygen and oxidation. And so to maintain methane in the atmosphere, uh, you might need a very high flux. And are there geologic processes that can do that relative to the biological? And I think knowing those fluxes of, of, of both the productions on the production side and the consumption side is really the critical consideration in evaluating methane's um, possibility as a biosignature. Um, and so the, the abiotic production of methane um, was initially thought to have been a really important part of the Hadean atmosphere. And that goes back to the classic arguments of Miller and Urey, put methane in their, in their little jar. Um, but we since have really discovered that we had a, a CO2 N2 dominated state, steady state Hadean atmosphere and that the world is, is imagined to have been too oxidizing at that time to sustain large amounts of methane production. So probably there was not a persistence of early methane. Uh, and this comes from this idea that the core formed early. And so we took a lot of metallic iron from the outer layers of earth and put it into our core very early in our history. And that left the rest of the mantle too oxidizing to support large amounts of, of methane production. And there is nested within this assumption that, the, that the, the mantle has not changed dramatically in its redox over the long history. And there's some debate about that. And that the early core formation, again, left the upper mantle relatively oxidized. So a lack of a Miller-Urey atmosphere, and that was one of the principal challenges to that really classic important early work that the atmosphere that they imagined was too reducing for what likely would have been present on the planet at that time. But a point that I'm gonna make more strongly in a second is that impacts the delivery of, of metallic iron, if large enough and frequent enough, could bring reductant to, the, to our, our own planet. 
in ways that could allow at least transiently production of methane and accumulation of methane in our atmosphere. So impacts could produce methane and from that you can get organic hazes that can block UV as I'll talk about. You can get methane photochemistry that can give large, it will give rise to larger molecules that can be the prebiotic building blocks as we think about origin of life scenarios. So this delivery of iron giving rise to hydrogen and that hydrogen reacting with CO2 to give rise to methane has become an important part of the conversation, not in a long lived steady state, the mantle could do this, but more associated with the intermittence of impacts delivering reductant and specifically metallic iron. So again, this methane could produce prebiotic molecules. And so this is a wonderful paper. If you don't know it, I encourage you to look at it that Kevin Zongli and colleagues published um, just last year where they model across a wide range of parameter space, the atmospheric effects of impacts. This is a Vesta size impact, which is a large body in the asteroid belt. So they just assumed a Vesta size impact and looked in, in again, in model space about the, at the change and, and sort of degeneration of that transient atmosphere. And, and so you see methane, you see associated haze production, um, but then you see those things tapering off on relatively short time scales. So these are transient atmospheric effects and the way to sustain them would be have large impacts for a long period of time, um, which is probably something that happened early in Earth history. We know from lunar crater chronologies and from, um, from the models of, of planetary formation and, and the distribution of, of objects within our own solar system that early in Earth history impacts were frequent and large. And so it's not hard to imagine that this effective impact um, on the redox state of the atmosphere uh, could have been an important part of what was going on. But what a question that we ask as biogeochemists is when was the takeover by, by biological production? Maybe transient Miller-Urey experiment uh, 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 conditions, but when did the world become methanic as we know for the Archean? This really comes down to biology. And so there are a number of different ways of looking at the, the, the origins of, of, from a biological standpoint of methanogenesis by, by microbes. And horizontal gene transfer, a paper um, published a few years ago, suggests it goes back about 4 billion years ago. We can quibble about the details of this depending on which molecular clock, which method you use genomically, but most people would put methanogenesis as a deeply rooted process going back to early in Earth history, late Hadean, Hadean, Archean uh, transition. And so as we think about a methane rich Archean, uh, we're not talking about necessarily requiring a different kind of mantle redox than, than we think or of, of a kind of frequency of impact to do it, but rather that, that biology now can generate those huge fluxes that can potentially overcome the sink terms, including photochemistry. So as we move forward in time, we have evidence in, in a variety of forms for a methanic Archean, at least, uh, the mass independent sulfur uh, record that requires some level PPM levels of methane in the atmosphere to drive those reactions. Uh, we can indirectly infer that there was a lot of methane production because of high nickel abundances from the weathering of comatiites that would have been abundant at that time. Nickel is an essential enzymatic cofactor in methanogenesis. So the abundance of these metals not only tells us about the redox state of the world, but also tells us about what's possible biologically because these, these micronutrients are essential for many different uh, microbiological pathways. Low oxygen and sulfate would have affected in ways that I'll talk about more later, both the production and preservation of methane within this world, including the importance of something we all know as anaerobic oxidation of methane, where once sulfate becomes more abundant in the ocean, which ties to the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere, then we can't, could have in the past, as we do today, lose an awful lot of methane through this anaerobic oxidation pathway, where through a consortial relationship, methane is oxidized and sulfate is reduced. This happens in sediments around the world today. And so it would have been an important regulator in, our, in, in Earth history in understanding um, the preservation potential of methane. So I'll come back to, the, to this, this role of sulfate. And so the, the Archean and potentially intermittently during the, during the Hadean uh, 
um, may have, rather than a blue sky, as some people have speculated, the world may have been orange because of, of high methane abundances and the hazes that form. Now these hazes actually, rather than having a greenhouse effect of warming, they actually block incident radiation from, from the sun. And so there is a cooling effect. It's not a runaway cooling effect because there's a self-shielding. Once the haze becomes significant again, enough, it blocks UV and it protects some of the methane below, in essence, from photochemistry. So, so you can imagine a steady state where there is haze development, but there's still a warming effect from methane. This is something that I think needs to be thought about more within our community is that these hazes also enhance planetary habitability through UV shielding. So you can reduce UV fluxes by as much as 97% um, because of these absorbance or blocking capabilities of the haze uh, relative to the solar influx of UV, um, which could have been really high at, at certain times, even though it was a, a faint and, and, and overall not very energetic um, sun, there, uh, there was a lot of flaring early in our history. And so we could have had pulses of tremendous UV fluxes to our planet that could have scavenged an atmosphere uh, and could have killed anything near the surface. The hazes would certainly help in that regard to protect from those high UV fluxes. Um, so what I want to talk about now is, is something that I've just really become involved with and, 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 and the NASA Astrobiology Institute, and this follows, is this idea of thinking about our very, very early history as we think about the evolution of, of life on our planet. The, the NASA Astrobiology Institute within the past couple of years has been replaced by, by something called the, 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 uh, by a network of five groups called Research Coordination Networks. And, and they explore a wide range of things, exoplanets, uh, ocean worlds, um, development of complexity on our planet. Um, the one that I'm involved with is called Prebiotic Chemistry in Early Earth Environments, PCE3. And I strongly encourage you all to, to look into this and get involved as much as you want to and feel free to write me and I can steer you towards all the right places, including a wonderful archive of a workshop that we held um, not so long ago. Um, and so the, the idea is to actually bring the geologic and the biogeochemical to the prebiotic. There's been far too long a sort of parallel but seldom intersecting uh, set of studies where a group of people are working on things I've been talking about, the development of the atmosphere, the evolution of the, of the very earliest atmosphere, the development of continents perhaps, uh, the appearance of oceans, and then on the other hand is a, is a large and often contentious, in my opinion, group of people and wonderfully creative group of people that are trying to come up with models for how, how life began on our planet. And there's very little agreement actually in many respects in that regard. And so our specific goal is to merge these worlds and think about the delivery and synthesis and fate of small molecules, developing larger molecules, protobiological periods, materials that ultimately become biological, a prebiotic world under the conditions of early earth. If you have a favorite model for prebiotic chemistry, we can as geologists and, and geochemists provide constraints on what would be possible within limits based on what we know about the earth at that time. So an improved understanding of origin of life may also help guide the search for life beyond our earth. As we target exoplanets for the possibility of extant life, we might think back billions of years of what that planet was like and whether it too could have had the right conditions for generating life so that we can detect those conditions now. Um, and, and so it's hard to do that, to extrapolate an understanding of the origin of life to a distant exoplanet when we don't understand it very well on our own planet. And so we're trying to help build that bridge. And so the, the, the prebiotic chemistry world is looking at you know, the, the production and delivery of small molecules, HCN, for example, precursors that develop into monomers and polymers. And then this all important and little understood step in how these larger molecules like DNA and RNA become the complexity that is life. And then on the other hand, there are those of us, many of you here, who are thinking about atmospheric evolution and impact history and crustal evolution. And our goal is really to try and bridge these things. If you have a particular model for delivery of compounds or the requirements for polymerization, as I'll talk about in a second, it'd be nice to know what the world was like at that time and whether it could support the sorts of things that are required within your model to do these reactions, these abiotic reactions as we move towards the biological. And so one of the central themes in all of this, and it's not true for all the origin of life models, but it's true for many of them,
is the importance of wet dry cycles. The idea of, of wetting and drying being really important in these early reactions that take small molecules and generate larger prebiotic molecules. So whether it's an event, a flood event, tidal cycles, periodic changes, seasonal changes, deliquescence, just the wetting and drying associated with salty materials. These are widely regarded as a means of driving condensation reactions under prebiotic conditions to generate mixtures of biopolymers. And this can be simulated in the lab. Many people have done this, where in a test tube you can wet and dry, where you've doped the cocktail and you watch the formation of larger and larger molecules associated with the wetting and drying. So if wetting and drying is really important in the beginnings of life, then that implies something, i.e. land masses and emergent land masses. And so that's one of the best examples I can think of how geologists can influence this community. If you need continents or something like a land mass, then we better as a community try and come up with an idea of whether that's possible. Otherwise your model has troubles. And if wet and dry cycles are all important, then how do you do this on a water world? There is a community of workers, a very learned community that would argue that life began and metabolisms can be supported by hydrothermal vents on seafloors. Um, but, uh, but if you need wet dry cycles, it's, it's, and there are ways of doing it potentially in icy worlds, but it's a challenge, right? It's, it's a constraint that you have to factor into the way you view the beginning of life. So water worlds and icy moons could be challenged by the notion of requiring wet dry cycles. Maybe you don't. Maybe there's not only one pathway, but these are the things that we don't know yet. So the origin of continents is something that all of you know a lot more about than I do, but, but we can all probably agree that there's not very much consensus on this. And so this is the fraction of continental crust over time from, um, from today to, the, to, to four and a half plus billion years before present. And there are various models, as many of you will know, with early formation and then sort of stabilization to a much more protracted development of continents. So it behooves us really, as we think about life on our planet to imagine when these continents formed. And importantly, as June Coronaga and many other people think about is when those, those continental areas, even if they were small, might've been emergent above sea level where you could have wet dry cycles. And so June and others, Simone Markey, my wonderful colleague who really focuses on the impact history of, of our own planet and other systems along with many other folks, but he's my closest contact to this world. Um, they have come up with some really clever ideas that don't require large continents or really any continents um, for, to drive wet drive cycles. And so June is, is keen on the idea of early hotspot activity. Um, so through mantle plume activity, you generate, as in the Hawaiian system today, um, uh, island chains that could be emergent and can give you a large enough area to have a wet dry cycle. Simone has also talked about impact generated topography where a large impact uh, through, uh, imp through consequences for the crust could, could give at least periodically or episodically um, through the, the central highland or the, or the crater rim could give you topography that's above, above the ocean. So we may not need to have early continents. Um, there might be other ways of doing this. So this early impact history has become an increasingly large part of the conversation about the beginnings of life on our planet and how we evolved into something that we know today, but, but especially those very beginning chapters. We tend to think of impacts as drivers of extinction for those of us who work in the Phanerozoic, but early in Earth history uh, impacts, large and frequent ones, may have played a major role in, in, in favoring the beginnings of life. And so I have put together this list I call the impact of impacts. And so the delivery of materials, organics, light elements, water, uh, movement of material from the light, light materials from the outer solar system to the beyond the frost line to the inner solar system. Crater topography that I've already talked about related to impacts. So reducing atmosphere that I've already talked about through the delivery of reductant where at least transiently you could have uh, conditions that might be consistent with a Miller-Urey type photo, photo um, or atmospheric uh, sequence of reactions. Greenhouse warming through the, through the methane, uh, haze effects that you get from uh, UV shielding that you get from haze effects. Uh, you can also stimulate hydrothermal activity. Um, we know that to be the case with these large impacts. Um, the, the material that's ejected is easily weathered, which has an effect on, on CO2 through reactions, silicate weathering. Um, and one of the things that's really emerged within this community is that the late heavy bombardment 
uh, from roughly 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, based historically on lunar chronologies, may not have been as heavy, as large, as deleterious to life as people once imagined. Um, so we were forced to sort of imagine subsurface refugia that would otherwise, that would mitigate against the sterilizing effect of these large and, and frequent impacts that came with this later pulse. Uh, Simone and others would tell you that there were late pulses, maybe at 4.1 billion years ago, for example, but there's no reason now in many people's minds to imagine that that was the bottleneck, that we could have started life and then would have killed it all off, in essence, or somehow eked through to then give rise to the life that we know in the Artean. The late heavy bombardment has been, I think, downgraded in terms of its, its damaging effects to the early stages of life. And then our planetary neighborhood, we have to think about what planets do, the role of Jupiter plays, for example, in controlling the distribution of, of objects that could impact our own planet and other planets. And so as you look at exoplanets, think about what's around them and what, other, what roles other planets within that system might play in, in distributing those materials and, and the likelihood of impact. So um, this idea, and I've already alluded to this, that we have this concern, it's a huge concern going forward of false positives, features attributed to life that form without life, causing us to suggest incorrectly that life is, was present. This is gonna be the thing, right? We learned from the Allen Hills meteorite that we wanna be really, really careful before we go to the front page of the New York Times saying life found. It will be really exciting to discover O2 or, or methane around another planet, but we wanna make sure that we cover that with an umbrella of caution that includes the emphasis on all these different abiotic pathways, including, including important abiotic pathways for the generation of O2 through the breakdown, for example, of, of carbon dioxide photochemically, which is particularly rampant uh, planets around M stars, which are particularly ab abundant within, within the galaxy. Um, so there are many planetary situations where large amounts, really large amounts of O2 can be produced without, at detectable levels without, without life. But what I wanna talk about um, really for the rest of the talk is something that my group is not uniquely um, uh, linked to, but, but something that we, I think, have helped put on the map within this discussion about life beyond our planet, and that is false negatives. The idea that there can be features that require life but escape our detection, causing us to suggest incorrectly that life is, was present. Um, so atmospheric compositions that, uh, that that you know that aren't that don't exist actually, even though life could be teeming within the ocean. So the idea that we might be looking at an exoplanet and not see biosignatures within that atmosphere, um, even though there could be life on the planet. Well, we may not ever know that, but recognizing that this is happening and it has happened a lot through our own history requires us to think of a broader array. Of, of, of gases and combination of gases in this search for life beyond. So again, features that require life but escape our detection, causing us to suggest that a planet is missing life when in fact it might not. And these folks and many others, but these folks in particular um, have been so central in the development of these ideas. Chris Reinhardt now at Georgia Tech, Noel Planaski, you all know at Yale, Stephanie Olson now at Purdue, and Eddie Schwederman, who was my postdoc and, and is now on our faculty at, at UCR. And I'm so delighted to have had the pleasure of working with all of them and many others as part of this very large team. Um, and so you will know that, that I and, and, and those around me have spent a lot of time thinking about oxygen through time. This is our latest oxygen curve. We stuck with the same colors just to be consistent from the 2014 paper. This has just been accepted. It doesn't change fundamentally. Uh, it, talks about, it talks about more dynamic oxygen levels um, in anticipation of the great oxidation event, uh, the possibility through related perhaps to things like large igneous province uh, activity, large igneous provinces, um, and, and, and something we, we talk a lot to Richard Ernst about and, and even dynamic behavior uh, in the Ediacaran and extending it to the Phanerozoic. Um, the, 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 how high oxygen actually was in the atmosphere during the, the Loma Gundi interval is, is open to debate, but it still looks fundamentally like the two steps that we know from the past and, and, and from our previous curve. And, and so what I'm gonna ask now is, is if you were looking at earth through this history, when would you have seen oxygen? And, and when would you have seen methane? And when would you have been able in our own atmosphere were you to be looking at us those billions of years ago? to be able to say something about our biosphere. And, and the answer to that is um, uh, 
it's it earth would not have given up its secrets very easily and 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 so this relates to the still low levels of oxygen which really dominated most of our history and in the face of the higher levels of sulfate that come with some increase of of uh, of oxygen which would affect in particular the production preservation detectability of methane so, so this is many different reactions, but it's not as complicated as you think. This is the, the, the sequence, it's a, sort of a delta G hierarchy of microbial reactions. The most energetic process is, is the breakdown of organic matter in the presence of O2, and then nitrate is the critical electron acceptor, then manganese oxid oxides and iron oxides, and then sulfate, and then ultimately methanogenesis. What we know from so much work in the modern world is that the production and preservation of methane is favored by low sulfate. Um, that's because when you have oxygen off the table, you lose these oxidized species. And so more reactive organic matter is available for methanogenesis. Uh, we know also that oxygen drives methanotrophy, the consumption of methane, but we also know that sulfate, which ties ultimately to the weathering of sulfides and oxygen in the biosphere, that sulfate through this anaerobic oxidation pathway also disfavors the preservation of methane. And so we have to think about the production and preservation terms and how they have played out over earth history. And so the traditional view of, of biosignatures were you to be looking at our planet over billions of years of history is that methane would have been detectable. And, and I think that methane in the Archean is a great example of a biosignature. Um, I think there are those that would argue that in the face of, of, of an absence of ozone shielding, so really aggressive loss of methane through photochemistry, that, that the fluxes must have been very high into the atmosphere, uh, which would have been favored by the high nickel contents, low oxygen, low sulfate, all those things I've talked about, that the fluxes may have been high, must have been high um, because of the photochemistry and perhaps higher than you could do by geology alone. And so methane detected in light of the context that we know about of our planet at that time was probably a great biosignature, but O2 at levels of 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus seventh present atmospheric level would never have been detected. It's not by any instrument that we know or can imagine. Today, O2 at 21% of the atmosphere is a great biosignature, but remember there are abiotic pathways with that level of, 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 of uh, atmospheric oxygen is probably a great biosignature. Methane um, in the face of all that oxygen is very, very low and would not be detected. So it's not a great biosignature. People long imagined that in the mid Proterozoic, um, the boring billion, that methane and O2 would, would coexist as a great disequilibrium biosignature, something Carl Sagan and others talked about, that you had high enough biological fluxes even in the face of a growing oxygen content to maintain this instability, a reduced gas and an oxidized gas. So these disequilibria, gases that, that would normally not be in an equilibrium thermodynamic sense stable together through the right kind of biological fluxes can be maintained at detectable levels. That's one of the sort of gold standards of biosignatures. But what, for reasons that I, I've mentioned already and, and, and others that we could talk about in great detail, my group thinks that oxygen was quite low based on a wide range of proxies, including chromium isotopes, but many other things. Um, and so oxygen was probably below detection. And methane, because oxygen was, was increasing so that sulfate abundances became abundant, not not abundance, but more abundance, certainly relative to the Archean. So sulfate would have limited production of methane, would have disfavored the preservation of it. So this is kind of a, a non-sweet spot, right? Where oxygen is higher, but still low. We wouldn't have probably seen the oxygen, but we also would have disfavored the production and preservation of methane. And so, so we might not have seen either of them as a biosignature gas at this time, and we not, would not have seen the disequilibrium. So probably at no point in Earth history would the classic methane oxygen disequilibrium have been detectable if you were, had, had been looking at our planet. And during the mid Proterozoic, it's not exactly clear what the biosignature would be were you to be looking at our atmosphere. Now here's the thing, right? So that we know during this time period that Ediacaran life, or excuse me, you cannot Ediacaran, eukaryotic life is appearing. Um, and so the ocean is teeming with prokaryotic biology. Eukaryotes are starting to emerge and, and starting to assert themselves in particular ecologically um, by the, by the Neoproterozoic, maybe by 800 million years ago, if not before. This is a chapter that gave rise to complexity, um, animal life. And so the world was teeming with life. 
yet we may not have seen any signs of that life for you to be looking at our atmosphere at this time. So that's a classic, a classic negative biosignature where life is happening, but you, but you wouldn't see it. The other thing about oxygen is that the early production, of course, would, would not have been on land, but in the surface ocean. And so there's this idea that Stephanie Olson and, and others have, have, have focused on that, that the, the surface ocean may have been oases, not just above a particular microbial mat, but that we know production of oxygen in the photic zone is high in continental regions, uh, continental margins uh, where upwelling is high. And so there could have been surface waters that were loaded with O2, but in the Archean, we know there weren't accumulations in the atmosphere, and we know that the deep ocean was anoxic, so there could have been a hot spot of O2 that could have supported early aerobic life, but we never would have seen it in the atmosphere. So biotic, biogenic O2 production may have predated remote detectability by 2 billion years. We and others think that biological O2 production began perhaps 3 billion years ago, maybe even earlier, but you may not have seen it for a couple of billion years, which is kind of frightening to think about. The other thing is that, that O2 can be produced in microenvironments for, in a microbial mat in a soil crust. And here's a really nice study. These are millimeter scales, very high levels of oxygen within a photosynthetic microbial mat, but that oxygen as it diffuses out is consumed through a reaction with the organic material of the mat and it would never make it into the atmosphere. So here's a, a thriving biosphere and even an evolving biosphere from one that's purely anaerobic to anaerobic and permissive of aerobic life that may not give up those secrets by looking at the atmosphere. So we have been, and this is where really where I'll end, we've been forced into thinking about, uh, in, in a really fun way, to think about other things that we might imagine as biosignatures around exoplanets. And one of the things that has excited us, and we published a paper a couple of years ago, is, is, is seasonality. We know that there is seasonality in O2 and CO2 in our own atmosphere, and it really reflects the, the seasonal difference between photosynthesis and respiration. It's particularly strong on our planet because we have an asymmetry, continental land masses in the northern hemisphere covered by plants. Um, and so I'll show you in a second, you all know what the CO2 seasonality looks like superimposed on the Keeling curve, which reflects the anthropogenic rise of carbon dioxide. And so we can imagine under the right circumstances that we might be able to see this, this seasonal respiratory photosynthetic cycle um, where during photosynthesis is releasing CO2 during warm months and O2 through respiration degradation of the organic matter uh, is consumed giving rise to an increase in carbon dioxide. So we are particularly keen in oxygen solubility. And the reason for that is quite simple is that, that you have warm month high production of oxygen through photosynthesis. And during those warm months, the O2 is actually less soluble within the water. So there is more production of O2 and it is degassed more efficiently from those surface waters. Um, CO2 is, is released preferentially during the colder months, but it's also retained because of higher solubility. So you see seasonality, but the O2 is a particularly good target. And a point that I also should make is that, that O2 also scales with the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. And that ozone is potentially a better target in terms of telescope technology than O2 itself. So ozone seasonality might be something to look for. And we have tried to make the argument with the, within the NASA community that uh, having a UV capability that would be optimized for ozone might be a, a really great kind of telescope to design. And so of course, this is what that seasonality looks like. Um, and there are other gases that are seasonal as well, including methane. So this idea that biology um, and it's not purely a biological expression, there are false positive concerns here as well, but that biology can manifest not just in a composition, a disequilibrium, a mixture of gases or a particular gas of some abundance, but it also can give rise to temporal patterns. And so by looking at an exoplanet multiple times, we might see variations. And the, the leading technology in all of this is something called direct imaging through a couple of different techniques where you can block out the starlight and get a direct image of the planet over some kind of temporal scale. Um, so you might get a strong signal to noise relationship, uh, a, a favorable kind of relationship, but also be able to do that over time. Um, the other thing that we've thought about is, is what does all of this really mean for the habitable zone? So the habitable zone 2.0, as I call it, remember that's that certain distance from a given star of a given brightness 
Um, so it's about the, the nature of the star, how far you are. Again, this is defined where you could have liquid water, but also, so importantly, the composition of the atmosphere. The outer edge of the habitable zone, um, as originally defined, um, is, is actually based on a maximum greenhouse, an upper limit on the extent to which additional uh, carbon dioxide can compensate for decreasing, as you're moving away from the star, stellar flux. It's actually an increase of one, uh, an excess of one bar of CO2. A huge amount of carbon dioxide is what now is presently defining the outer edge of the habitable zone. Beyond those high levels of carbon dioxide, it actually, actually, uh, it actually imposes a cooling effect. So there is an optimal amount of carbon dioxide and you can go too far and it starts to have the opposite effect. So we asked the simple question, and this is, these are the kinds of games that we can play, those of us who are especially versed in geology and biogeochemistry, et cetera, what could be living in an outer edge of the habitable zone? So this is a very high level of carbon dioxide and so we start to think about physiology and in particular for complex life. And so here for humans, squid, sponge, um, you know, and, and so it's, you know, it, the, those levels of CO2 um, based on the present definition of the outer edge of the habitable zone are, are way too high. So here, the, here are those levels of carbon dioxide and M star is fainter than our G star. So that's why you're seeing an increasing amount of CO2 because the star is fainter. But look how much higher they are. There could be microbial life, but in terms of complex life, not in any way that we understand the effects of this hypercapnia process, the very high levels, toxicity of high CO2. Also the pH would be, uh, would be very low as we know from what's happening today with ocean acidification, with which uh, with much lower levels of CO2, but still the pH effects are being felt. So we're starting to think about sort of the ecology of the habitable zone, not only that there's liquid water that could sustain life, but what kind of life could be living and where are the sweet spots within habitable zones? And it turns out for complex life that it's actually not the outer edge uh, and it's not even all of the inner edge because there is a, a portion where high levels of carbon monoxide are predicted. So it's just like one quartile of the habitable zone would be a good target for complex life. So if you're making car target selection and you're interested in complex life, maybe you're interested in techno signatures, advanced civilizations, you might pick a planet that's not just in the habitable zone, but in the right part of the habitable zone. And remember, we're not gonna do an infinite number of atmospheric characterizations. There's a lot of competition for telescope time. And so you're gonna to have to make a very strong case and a proposal for why your planet should get some amount of that precious telescope time to, to characterize the atmosphere around it. So we have just been renewed. The NASA Astrobiology Institute does not exist anymore, um, but it has been replaced by the Research Coordination Network and large team funding through the, uh, through the ICAR program. And happily we were just funded uh, our alternative earth team is now funded for another five years and our central theme is how to build and sustain a detectable biosphere with many of the same players and some additions georgia tech with chris and yale at, uh, with noah and purdue with stephanie but we also now have added nasa ames and, and our, our our sister campus within the uc ucla um, and so we do a lot of different things and this is what's so fun about it to be able to surround myself with people who have expertise that's different and far beyond mine in, in many different areas. We think about diverse planetary scenarios that our own planet has taught us and we can play in like a Lego sense with constructing hypothetical planets that would still have requirements for nutrient cycling, et cetera. Is air plate tectonics important? If, what does our own planet tell us about that? How could we detect plate tectonics on a distant, distant planet? So we think about what our own Earth has told us about planetary scenarios and how we can come up with hypothetical other scenarios. And we have developed proxies to characterize all these different chapters, geochemical proxies, chapters of Earth history, and, and we can look at parallel records of life through those different phases of, of our own history. And then we imagine um, how all these proxies fit together into a particular ocean model. And we use things like, like the Gini model that our own Andy Ridgewell is such an expert on. So 3D physical ocean models that also have biogeochemistry. And from those coupled with GCM models, we can imagine the gas fluxes into the atmosphere where then photochemical things kick in. And this is where Eddie Schwederman and others come in and our, our, our co connection to the Virtual Planetary Lab at the University of Washington, all the great code models that they have for simulating these different worlds. And so we can imagine the steady state environment 
atmosphere that would result from a given flux as informed by all these things lower down on this ladder. And then we can come up with sort of a hypothetical spectrum for what the, uh, the mid Proterozoic, for example, atmosphere would look like, synthetic spectra based on radiative transfer models. So I could give you a synthetic spectrum of what the, the Earth's atmosphere based on all these things below, both, both empirical and theoretical, uh, what that atmosphere would, would look like. And, and then um, we can think about the detectability of those, those gases, that, that hypothetical atmosphere. So we use instrument simulators with the James Webb Space Telescope have been able to see methane were you to be looking at the Earth 1.5 billion years ago. Would it, have been a, would it be able to see the O2 level or the O3 level? And so all of these pieces then fit together, as I said, in a practical sense towards things like telescope design. What are the, and you know, this is something I sit down with my own sons. I think, you know what we have in the atmosphere and you know what's on our planet. Uh, what are the biosignatures in our atmosphere? What if I change this? What would, how would you see life um, on our own planet based simply on the gases that are present within our atmosphere? And so it's an exciting time ahead. Kepler and TESS for planetary detection. Webb is scheduled after many delays to launch soon. And it is not uniquely an exoplanetary mission. Um, but there will be a, a significant amount of telescope time devoted to a much more sophisticated compared to what we've done to date, characterization of exoplanet atmosphere. So people are scrambling already to, to pitch their favorite targets for Webb telescope time. And then most excitedly, as we look forward to the next decade, couple of decades, are our missions like Louvoir and HAVEX and many others that are just in the development phase that are really gonna be optimized for exoplanet characterizations, including the direct imaging capability where you, where by one model you put something called a star shade, which is a, it's actually a, a shade that flies in tandem um, with the telescope itself and blocks the stars so that you're just getting light that's reflected from, from the planet. Um, or there's a way, something called a coronagraph that's actually within the telescope itself imagine like your finger, but you're doing this in a complex way, including a lot of digital processing, blocking the starlight and getting a, a much stronger signal from the, um, from the, the planet itself and also in, in giving us this capability for temporal, temporal resolution. And I think that that is um, the end. So, um, so think spacey and, and, and if this is something that you haven't thought about before, realize that this community of, of workers, the astronomers, the exoplanetary scientists, the planetary science community, that they need us. They need th those of us who think about planetary systems holistically and all their different pieces and how those things from the biotic to the abiotic come together to give rise to surface and atmospheric expressions of the life on our own planet in ways that might be extrapolatable to other planets. So thanks so much for this opportunity today. Thank you, Tim, so much for that. So really impressive to see you make these connections and you know, remind everybody of really our place as Precambrian geologists for, for this. Um, so what we normally do at this point is we start to uh, switch into a um, discussion period. And what I haven't really warned you about, Tim, is that our audience is just as much a uh, star of the show as our speaker and where we just... Yes. We do not, uh, we haven't yet really uh, cut anybody off uh, as, for a discussion. So unless you have, you know, a time today that you need to, if your schedule is restricted, we will just let it go. Um, go for it. And I'm happy to stop talking and to be educated by all the people who know more about the Precambrian than I do. All right. Well, then, in that case, as we usually do, um, We'll let people uh, think of that. Think of their questions. Um, if you would like to ask your question directly, you can put a star in the uh, in the chat, or you can raise your hand virtually. If you don't have a microphone, or for some reason would rather not ask your question yourself, I, you can type it, and I can ask it for you. Um, but it looks like um, Paul, you Paul Hoffman, you had had some questions and points. If you want. I can ask them for you, or you can uh, talk directly with Tim. Um, go ahead. <clears throat> hi, Paul. Hi. How are you? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Alex. It's in the chat. 
Yeah, yeah. So Tim, his first question is, uh, do the Jack Hills, Haiti, and Detroit Zircons require liquid oceans to be at the surface as opposed to subsurface or under glacial ice? Uh, you know, that's a really great question. And I, that's, this is not a field that I work in, but I've increasingly been trying to understand what the implications uh, for these zircons are in terms of oceans. And, you know, I, I'm going to give you my perspective on it. There are going to be other people in the audience who are going to know more about this. But basically, the, what, what the oxygen isotopes are telling us is that there's a heaviness of the oxygen, and you'll know this, Paul, that's related to low temperature seafloor water, liquid water interactions, okay? And so, so, you, so you immediately need these interactions between liquid water and, and, um, and, and seafloor itself. Now that doesn't require an ocean necessarily, right? Um, but from these altered basaltic crusts, you have to then be able to generate zircons. And so, you know, that begs the question that you and other people think a lot about is, you know, how do you get these differentiation processes? How do you get something that's a bit more felsic or a lot more felsic or intermediate that could be hosting zircons, um, generating zircons from, from that kind of interaction that I'm talking about? And this is where really a lot of the mystery comes in. You know, the best way to do this is through subduction. But, you know, the idea of Hadean subduction is not a particularly popular one. Um, there are other ways of doing differentiation um, just through crustal melt processes. Um, there is also the possibility of differentiation um, through impacts. And so there are people who talk about early crust formation through, the, through, through differentiation processes related to large melt pools um, through, through a large impact. So I guess what I would say to you, and, and I wish John Valley were here to be able to comment further on this, but what I would say to you is that there's an abundance of these zircons. They're not just from the Jack Hills anymore. So that was a little bit troubling that it was such a localized record, but now they're increasingly found from many different places. There is some debate about the earliest ones that show this look at water capability or record, but, um, but they are pretty widespread now. And so, you know, the, the way I tend to think of it is that you know, to have a system where you have this low, this relatively low temperature basalt seawater interaction, you're, you're generating those oxygen diagnostic ice, oxygen isotope compositions, and then you're somehow tectonically or in, through impact processing these things to give rise to a large swath and a large abundance of, of zircons, to me implies a largeness of scale and a persistence of process. Um, but, you know, whether that requires an ocean as we know it, uh, that's anybody's guess. There are some people, some models, people who think about this more than I do, that suggest that we had even more liquid water at that time. Um, yeah, so, Jim, Jim yeah. Uh, yeah, I have no problem. I'm on the Fife curve. I think there was plate tectonics from continents in the Hadean. There you my go. Question, <clears throat> my question was a biological one. Did that ocean have to be in sunlight? Oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, God, no. Yeah, okay, but no. people say loosely that those zircons imply surface ocean. Yeah, and I'm I, questioning, be careful when you say surface. Uh, well, surface, do, yeah, surface means not, not below an icy crust or not, in the, and not, and not below the ground. <laughs> that's what well, I, I mean. Think that's what surface means. It's in, well, okay, that's fine, yes. Not the ocean so, atmosphere. Fair enough. Uh, and, 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 and surface doesn't, so that's very specific to say surface is not only surface, but shallow. There's really not a, a prerequisite. No, no, not shallow, but that, 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 that the liquid water is being lit you. by the sunlight. So it yeah, has there, that source of energy. Yeah, I can, I can comment on that specifically. There's really not much about most of these models that require, or any of these models that require light in that way, photosynthesis. So, uh, you know, when metabolisms became meta metabolisms, when photosynthesis developed, some people think there are records in carbon isotopes at 4.1, but we're talking about much earlier than that, right? And so, so the, the, you know, the hydrothermal model is deep in the ocean. Um, the wetting drying, you know, if anything, those reactions are challenged by light because of the, because of the high UV fluxes, especially during times of flaring, and that's where, where hazes might come in. So no, there, it, doesn't, it doesn't require s shallow ocean light penetration, photic zone site kinds of processes. Um, and so- And if you yeah, cover I, it with ice, if you cover it with ice, it's an easy way to keep, have the ocean warm. I, I, even well, if the I think surface is extremely cold, so it gets around the dim sun problem. I, I think that's, that's exactly right. Um, and so, you know, that's a really popular idea for those who care about Enceladus. I mean, the, uh, the, the Meromectic Lakes and the, you know, like, like, like Vanda, the bottom water is 24 degrees C. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you have to think prebiotically here, Paul. We're not, this isn't really life yet. What we're trying to do is get no, to- but the Vanda, the temperature's not dependent on life. No, but what, I, what I'm really talking about is the role of light in a prebiotic sense. So yeah. in the atmosphere, if it's, if, it's, if it's a reducing atmosphere, especially, and it has methane, then we, and there's meteoric, mete, meteorite delivery as well, we can have these, these initial prebiotic reactions to start to build these, these, these building blocks. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for the Enceladus Europa community because, right, it's, you know, that's all happening beneath an ice sheet. That's really your world, right? So there's a thick ice cover. These ice covers may have been 40 to 100 kilometers thick in places like uh, may be in Europa and Enceladus. So what you're in essence doing is, is producing life and sustaining metabolisms in the complete absence of light. And so the, the question is, how do you do that? Um, you can do it in some people's minds at a hydrothermal vent that doesn't have any relationship to light. Um, in other people's minds, you need these wet dry cycles. And then it comes to people like you thinking about, let's imagine the dynamics of a very thick ice cap. And there are people who model these in a sort of plate tectonic sense. You have a high UV fluxes, very high radiation fluxes in, around Jupiter, for example. So there's a lot of oxidized material at the oxidized sulfur, for example, at the, at the surface of that ice. And if you have something analogous to subduction that's bringing those ox oxidized materials down, and you have highly reducing waters beneath, then you have the classic juxtaposition of oxidized and reduced materials that you need to support a microbial metabolism. But how you do wet dry cycles in that, if that's required for building larger molecules from small molecules, is a little less clear to me. But people imagine this. There are dehydration reactions that can occur even in the presence of water if it's salty enough. This is what that community does. And, and you have a lot to offer in that, in, in, in what icy worlds are like. And, and, and there's so much money and interest invested now in things like Enceladus and Europa that are you know, not so different than an ice covered or a large amount of ice surface water, uh, surface ocean ice in a snowball earth. Yeah, but if you're gonna do this based on competition with China, I'm with China. Excuse me? <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> You mean who's going to get there first in terms of an answer? No, I'm talking about national strategic policy. Okay. <laughs> I'm not quite, quite sure I follow you, but... Well, the, the whole uh, the new science initiative under Biden is based on outcompeting China. Oh, well... That runs completely sideways into the ambition to do something about the climate that absolutely requires international cooperation. And oh, we should well. be helping China to develop oil as an alternative to coal. I'm with you. That we shouldn't be sending warships into the South Sea because the reason they want the South Sea is their own continental margin beyond the international 200 mile limit for oil exploration. I, I totally agree with you. That's a very interesting and important sidestep. I, I did read yesterday that's, uh, that, that, uh, that China is committed to carbon neutrality by 2060 and moving away from coal. We'll see if that happens. But, well, but it makes it a very, uh, a very uh, uh, good situation to put pressure on China if you do it the right way. China's trying to behave like, act like the good guy. So hold them to it. That's a policy that can work. Forget about Uyghurs. They're not going to give an inch on anything that has to do with their own sovereignty. That's just yeah. posturing. I agree. But let, me, let me just put this, let me put this back in a science, uh, uh, something yeah. that's related to what we're talking about here. And those well, are great points, Paul. They're linked. They are, they are linked. And the, and, and the way that they're linked in particular is, is where money is invested in, in, by governments. Well, that's uh, right. So I get you know, unending emails uh, you know, to support the Biden initiative, but it runs counter to the whole international uh, interests of science. Right, but let me, like, let me put it back on the rail, great points, but let me put it back on the rail of what I'm talking about right here is, so, so right, more money, money well spent, all of these things for climate change, that's a given. How that works is... Okay, like, here's oh, how it can work. No, 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 it no, comes no. to my second question. Is there any prospect of weaning NASA off the International Space Station? Oh, because that consumes more money than the rest of the program combined. And it's absolutely devoid of science. And if you don't believe me, go to the website of the uh, um, uh, American Physics Society that publishes Physics Today. It's the physics equivalent of AGU. And in 1993, 
as a society, they made a statement of non-support for, uh, for the manned space program, including the International Space Station. There's nothing that's being done there that wasn't done long ago on Mir. Right, right. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go down too many of these rabbit holes. Uh, it would be fun to talk about this offline, Paul. What I, what I will tell you is that one of the things that's been really heartening about getting involved in NASA research is that it crosses the aisle better than most things. And one of the strongest advocates, for example, from, uh, for Europa research, he's not in office anymore, but was a conservative Republican. And so I, you know, I wish climate change were the same way. It's not, um, but this kind of work that we're talking about, and there's the planetary science decadal that's in the works right now. And so it's gonna be full speed ahead. Probably I'm, my prediction is for direct imaging for exoplanets, they'll probably, my guess is that there'll be an Enceladus mission. I don't know anything about that. That's what I would advocate for. And we see the investment that's being made, not just in the US, but in Europe, excuse me, in Europe now for Venus research. So I, we're trying to, you know, apoliticize this as much as possible. And there are strong links to the commercial sector as well, SpaceX and many others. Um, so I think this work is going to keep going forward. And going back to your point, Paul, there is always going to be always going to be an important part of NASA's mission that's going to be based on on human spaceflight. Uh, there, there will always. And so it, that will become part of a Mars mission that's already in the works. We already have money set aside, at least for part of what's required for sample return from the Perseverance rover. And these are really steps towards the inevitability of putting a human on Mars. And the role that the space station does or doesn't play in all of that is something that many people would debate in many different directions. But I think that it's a good time to be doing NASA research. And I think it's also a good time to be protecting those satellites that are absorbing, uh, that are orbiting Earth, that are feeding us all the important data that we need for climate change research, some of which were vulnerable during previous administrations. So, so you know, yes, I get it. I agree with, you know, what you say, but I cannot support man on Mars. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> and human on Mars, Paul, by the way. <laughs> um, I think we have several questions from some others. I want to, so let's go ahead and hear from, from some other individuals. I know, uh, I guess Ilya Bindeman looks like he was here a moment ago under the name of Cascades, but... He had mentioned some comments about um, 18.0. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just read them off. Uh, he says, unless you froze the ocean completely, any ice will be hydrologically processed, thus low delta 18.0, not good, not good for high delta 18.0. Okay, good point. Um, and with, with that said, just to make sure that his point was made, uh, I, Hannah Davies, you had put your, your hand up a while back, so go right ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Uh, nice to nice talk, Timothy. Uh, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, so I just had a couple of questions. Uh, of I, I don't worry. I won't. I won't bombard you. I was saving them because I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, and uh, just one comment. So um, something you mentioned that I actually uh, I I didn't realize was was possible. But you said that uh, high levels of of atmospheric oxygen can be or free oxygen can be made um, abiotically. Yeah. Oh, uh, so. Yeah. So is that possible around stars like our own? Um, is there a way to kind of isolate and say, okay, so for these star types or for these star ages, abiotic free oxygen is impossible? Um, or is it, is it something that is just always going to be like in the background of, of observation of, of biosignatures? Um, so the, the problem is particularly rampant um, associated with planets around, uh, around M stars, which are fa fainter than our own, our own G-type star. Um, and so there are a lot of M stars. The, the data that we have are actually sort of skewed. If you look at the population densities of different planet sizes, um, and there are people who can speak to this better than I, I but there are many M stars um, that have been discovered. Or, and, and so planets around M stars that have been discovered and will continue to be discovered. And so there is a large portion of the community that focuses on characterization of M stars. So the habitable zone for an M star is, is much closer than it would be for a brighter star, right? Because the star is less, is less bright. Um, and, and so that means that the planets transit more often because they're closer to the star. So they're, they're attractive for a, a lot of different reasons, but these, these stars are, are particularly well known for uh, 
this production of abiotic O2. And so I've heard reports of multibar O2, huge amounts of oxygen. So, you know, I wish an atmospheric chemist were here to take this question. If you're out there, help me. But, but those very high levels of O2 are already an early warning sign. Um, the other thing, and this is really speaks more generally to how you do all of this work, is that anytime you generate the gas or the, whatever the biosignature is that you're interested in, when you generate that, there's always context. There's always something else that you should measure in tandem that will alert you to that possibility. And in the case of abiotic O2 production, there is, a, there is associated carbon monoxide. Um, and so certain levels of carbon monoxide in combination with that would be a fingerprint. So the very high levels of O2, the context that it's a planet around an M star, which are known for this abiotic pathway and, and having the carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide has historically been viewed as an antibiosignature. Now it's toxic to complex life, but actually there are many through acetogenesis, there are many organisms that use carbon monoxide, require carbon monoxide. We have actually modeled in a reducing ocean like early earth um, and we published a paper on this where you can actually sustain a carbon monoxide, detectable carbon monoxide containing atmosphere uh, in the presence of life. So the carbon monoxide argument is really interesting and it's, it, and it's a different argument for prokaryotic life than it is for complex life. But the short answer for what you're saying is it's the planet star context, the type of star that it is, that's the first step. It's the abundance of the gas, that's the second step and it's the associated gases with that O2 that start to say, hey, this is a concern. And so everything, everything is about context. It's really hard to make an isolated measurement and say it must be this. And that's where the geology comes in. I'm particularly interested in abiotic pathways and methane production. How high can they be? Under what tectonic regime can you get more methane versus less methane and so forth? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a, a geologist as well. So that's, that's interesting to me too. And uh, so, um, again, I'm going to step outside of my comfort zone and, and ask about stellar evolution because uh, I, I was curious about we you you are talking about different habitable Earths and different types of of Earth and a Earth ages and and obviously the Archean and the Hadean Earth was was habitable but was almost unrecognizable from the the present. Uh, solar system not just yeah. the earth system not just the earth right. system was different but the soul this the, the sun itself was different too and, and is, is that a consideration do you consider a uh, stellar age when you're looking at habitability of planets especially considering you said uh the habitable zone 2.0 is much narrower than the kind of the old habitable zone uh, obviously that's going to change through through uh the solar system's uh lifetime and earth was very much at the edge of the habitable zone okay. Uh, in the Archean. So, so um, what, 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 what are your thoughts on that? So stellar evolution is, is critical, right? So, you know, so you can look at a given star and know what it is. Um, and, and by knowing what it is, you can, uh, for example, you know how old it is, you know what its longevity is. Some stars are not around for very long. Others, um, main sequence stars can be around for billions and billions and billions of years. And so one of the things that we do as a group is actually project to future Earth. Um, and one of the really, one of the really interesting parts of that is that, you know, as our sun gets brighter, and this has relevance as you think about exoplanets, as our sun gets brighter, the silicate weathering feedback actually pulls down the amount of carbon dioxide. And so you can actually get to a point where carbon dioxide becomes limiting to life. Now we're projecting for billions of years, but carbon dioxide becomes limiting and you actually can't support the biological photosynthetic production of O2 and the world actually might return to something that is, um, is anaerobic like most of Earth hist earlier Earth history. Um, the other thing that happens favorably is that when a star is that bright, the base level of carbon dioxide becomes low enough where that seasonality starts to become big relative to the base level. So if you were to be looking at Earth, it would be really hard to see that seasonality because it's just a small variation, as we know from the Keeling curve. You know, we've gone up 100, 100 ppm in CO2 since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And that seasonality is just a small blip along that curve. So it would be really hard given the instrumentation to see that seasonality. But as, as Earth, as the sun continues to brighten, that, that base level will drop and the seasonality relative to that base level might become might become more detectable. So, so stellar evolution is, is critical. I think of it also in terms of, you know, where a, a planet came from, you know, not, not only how old is the system, but what was the early history? 
and thinking thinking about you know our our own star the the abundance of flaring during the Hadean and the and the positive and deleterious effects that come with that. So I like to project the not just the sustainability of habitability, but also to think about origin of life scenarios that may have played out similarly or differently on different planets around different kinds of stars. And that was really the point that I was making that, that you know, as we pick targets, we might think about where they came from rather than just where they are right now. And that's not, not been a huge part of the conversation in part because it's still a nascent field. And also we don't really understand where life came from on our own planet. You get a large amount of information from stars, including um, compositional information. So we can look at stars, do spectral analysis, know what their elemental compositions are and make inferences about what the rest of the, of the what the planetary system with around that star would be like. So the stars are, are, are critical. Stellar evolution is critical. The composition of the star, it's, it's inferred, it's inferred past and its future would be important in all these arguments. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so one extra comment. Yep. Uh, you were talking about wetting and drying, which I'm actually uh, currently looking at uh, with tidal models of the Archean. Um, cool. So uh, something that I would mention with regards to saying small volcanic islands and island arc chains and uh, impact related um, emergence of land, uh, the, the tidal Deep. range, particularly in uh, an exoplanet without a moon like ours would be incredibly small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the wetting and drying surface area would be very small. And yeah. the thing is, if you if you apply the statistics over 500 million years, even a couple of centimeters of wetting drying might be enough to develop life. So uh, I actually think that the wetting drying is very important, too. I'm not trying to shoot it down, but uh, let's hope maybe we find a couple of exomoons soon. Because well, you know, I'm Finding an Earth-like planet with a moon around it would be amazing. That's exactly what these discussions should be like. You've just come up with a perfect paper. You should write that paper, right? You should talk. I'm about working it. on it. <laughs> no, but I mean, in terms of exo, in terms of wet dry cycles and relevance for um, relevance for life, origins of life, prebiotic chemistry, and 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 you should map that across island arcs. And and so I'm also thinking, or not island arcs, but across uh, hotspot type activity and et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that I'm thinking about is that, you know, those might be steep topographies relative to gentle topographies, which would affect the tidal range as well. And so sort of running the theory across all of that different parameter space and what, um, what an, a Hadean, I'm not just Hadean, but really early earth might've been like in terms of what tides could do would be a, would be a much cited and really interesting paper because mm -hmm. this wet yeah, drive, this Sorry. wet dry theme is not going away. It's really yeah. central to a lot of arguments. I mean, just a reference, like the highest S2, so solar tide. So assuming there's no lunar tide, the highest solar tide in the present day, because the solar tide wouldn't change through time, yeah. is, is around 12 centimeters. So, uh, you know, you're comparing it to the M2 tide, which is two meters, uh, four meters uh, in, in certain parts of the world. Um, that, that kind of uh, difference is really, really important. And so, um, yeah, maybe maybe we can talk about this a little. Yeah, bit I would more. love to. Uh, I'll, love I'll to give you. Yeah, I'll give was, the people the floor. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly it's exactly that kind of thought space that this this community is interested in. And if you think about the Earth with a with a single moon, so non competing effects, and 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 a and and a pretty large moon, and, and and close early on relative to where it is today, then tidal effects may have been pronounced, but. But that certainly may not be true, and it may not be true in other places as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, let's keep talking. That would be great. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll give you. up the floor now. Thank you. A great point, though. Thank you. Hey, so, we've got a couple more that uh, are in the chat still from before. Nadezda yep. Alfamova asks, or says, first, thank you for the spectacular perspective, and asks, is there a way to differentiate an atmospheric, uh, atmospheric point of view between life? from hydrothermal sources to surface low temperature conditions? Well, that's, you know, that's a really good question. I think, you know, you, 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 you can answer the question yourself in the sense that, you know, what you're getting is the atmosphere, right? I mean, you really are literally getting the atmosphere. And so if you're looking at, and, and you know, you have to also realize that the information, and I was just part of a workshop a couple of days ago, the information that's going to come from these planets and is starting to come already might be a single pixel of, of atmospheric composition. Um, there was talk about having large arrays and projecting forward centuries and millennia where we might be able to get a planet represented in 20 pixels, perhaps, maybe. Um, so you're not going to get, 
you know, like earth imaging, where we have all these latitudinal gradients and we can see productive margins and think about the chlorophyll records that we get from our own ocean, where we can see divergence in the ocean and, 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 and make predictions about where the life should be. And that's a great biosignature. That's hard to do with a, with a single pixel. Um, and so it really is a single pixel of gases that, that are that are varying temporally perhaps, and that's probably information we can get. We might be able to get a little bit of spatial resolution. For example, if the planet is spinning, we can see albedo change where continents are rotating in and out of the, of the field of view. Another thing that we have to think about is that a lot of these planets will be tidally locked, which means one side of the planet, like our moon, will be facing, that, uh, will be facing the star all the time. So there's a lot of interest in, in modeling life on a planet that has one dark side and one light side always. Um, and so you might think that it's uninhabitably cold on one side, which would preclude life everywhere. But in fact, there's a lot of, there's a lot of heat exchange through atmospheric circulation and through ocean circulation, even in a world like that, that may not, may not make it as bleak as you imagine. So you're left with this pixel for the sake of argument of atmospheric composition. And then as, as, as a geologist, I would ask you and say, what gases would you look for that might be detectable that would tell you that hydrothermal activity is occurring? So we think about tectonic signatures all the time. Um, so you might think about SO2 as related to volcanic release. Of course, that's more abundant in some volcanoes than others. Um, but that, those are exactly the kinds of questions. If hydrothermal activity is, 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 is rampant on the, on the seafloor of this given planet, but there's not a gaseous expression of that in the atmosphere, um, it would be hard to know. You might get in the infrared if it's a particularly hot, thermally active planets. You, you might be able to see that and could infer that there's a lot of hydrothermal activity, but you really are pretty much stuck with the gases of the atmosphere. There is a community that works on pigments. Remember, you have to get through cloud cover around these planets as well, but assuming that you could do that, there is interest in, in pigments in surface oceans and on continents that, um, that can also be expressions of life. And, and famously looking at our own planet, there's something called the red edge in the visible. So there's a dramatic drop off at, right at the red within the visible that is related to uh, plant material on continents, but it also can be associated with algae in the, in the surface most ocean. Um, so, you know, there are possibilities from, from glint off a water surface, but most of the focus is on atmospheres. And so again, like with your expertise, imagine our own planet, what is it in our atmosphere that is telling you that we have hydrothermal activity, that we have mid-ocean ridges, that we have all these different uh, locations of, of similar and different tectonic regimes that are giving us hydrothermal activity. What impact does that have on our atmosphere and, and how could that express itself in a detectable way that would it say uniquely that's related to hydrothermal activity? Um, it's hard, it's hard. So there's a follow-up uh, from Nadesa. In that way, it is not that crucial to differ differentiate these conditions here on Earth. Thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the tectonic question is really huge. And that's one of the things that we as geologists brings, bring into the mix. So um, I think we as a group think a lot about nutrient cycling. Um, so Chris and Noah and, and, and many others think a lot about, about that in the mid-Proterozoic uh, the so-called boring billion um, oxygen levels that we can debate how high they were, but they were intermediate relative to what was before and what came after. And how you sustain that is ultimately a nutrient question. My group and others have, have argued historically about metal limitation and, and the ability enzymatically through molybdenum abundance in particular to, to fix nitrogen. And we have argued heretically, I think, for nitrogen limitation. Most of the focus now is on phosphorus limitation. The, the early reducing ocean because of the abundance of the mid Proterozoic, um, because of the abundance of iron and earlier oceans as well, the abundance of iron, there are multiple ways of, 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 of impacting the phosphorus cycle through the formation of iron phosphate, through the scavenging of phosphate onto iron oxides and in our models for ocean redox and its evolution and the abundances of phosphorus and shale match, match pretty well. Now, nitrogen can be fixed from the atmosphere and when that started and, and, and what controlled it over Earth history is something that Ava Stuck and my favorite, favorite not favorite, maybe so, but favorite, my, my, my former postdoc uh, has thought a, an awful lot about. Um, 
but phosphorus is really interesting because you know phosphorus on our own planet comes from the weathering of rocks so it's about uplift the mountains and recycling phosphorus or it's about seafloor weathering but that still probably requires resurfacing and c4 spreading and so i have argued and some people have challenged me on this but i have argued that you need tectonics to keep phosphorus cycling um, and and how would we know if a distant planet was going through that so so hydrothermal is critical if you think that's how life began. Tectonics are critical if you think that's essential to phosphorus recycling. All of these things that we know of on our own planet as playing roles are gonna be important in other places as well. Yeah, I'll uh, take the moment to mention uh, Ava Stoiken is on the schedule for the summer. Oh, uh, but uh, you have another question from Hafira Bilali. Uh, great talk, Tim. Given models and evidence from Venus having earlier Earth-like conditions, what, lesson, what lessons does the comparison of the evolution of Earth and Venus have for habit habitability of Earth-like extrasolar planets? Well, I think that, you know, the, I, Venus is a, is a really exciting planet, right? For those of you who don't planet, follow planetary science, Venus has a temperature of four to 500 degrees C now, which as people like to say to the press is hot enough to melt lead. Um, but there are arguments um, that, that Venus had a previous habitability. And so this idea of comparative planetology between Venus, Earth, and Mars is really interesting. So early on in their histories, they may have been very similar. Venus may have had liquid oceans and Mars, we know, had, had large amounts of water at, at the surface of the planet. Um, and, and one is Mars, is at the outer edge of the habitable zone, and Venus is on the inner edge of the habitable zone. One of the reasons that it's really interesting to the exoplanet community is that Venus is, is almost exactly the size of Earth. Um, it's a rocky, it's a terrestrial planet. Um, it's, on, it's just on the inside of the habitable zone. If you were looking at Venus from, from light years away, you might say, yeah, yeah, that's more or less in the habitable zone, particularly because atmospheric gases play such an important role. And so you might choose that as a target and you would never know that it's not habitable until you see all that well, at least that's my opinion, that it's not habitable now because the atmosphere is full of sulfuric acid. It has about a, it has about a hundred bar atmosphere that's made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide. So Venus has experienced an incredible runaway greenhouse. And um, so, you know, why Venus went bad and how it went bad uh, is really interesting. Um, and so part of it is the presumed lack of Earth-like plate tectonics, the ability to remove carbon from the from surface environments through subduction. Um, the other th way of thinking about it that I often think about is that because it was that much hotter, it lost its oceans. Uh, and eventually, once they go to the atmosphere, um, they can be swept away. Um, but also through, through photochemistry, you can lose an ocean through hydrogen loss from the atmosphere. And once you lose that water, then it's really kind of hard to impossible to have the silicate weathering feedback. And so no longer you do have those silicate reactions that are pulling down carbon dioxide. So you have massive amounts of carbon dioxide that are supported by lots of volcanic release. And so I think that this idea that you have two in, in many respects similar planets, but with fundamental differences is really critically important as you think about other planets that may or may not sustain life. So it's like, you know, why did Venus, quote unquote, go bad and Earth not and Mars go bad? And the Mars argument is many fold, but part of that is that it's smaller. Um, it, it lost its magnetic field um, early on through cooling and, and solar wind scavenges atmosphere. So it's not just about having an atmosphere, but it's retaining the atmosphere and the importance of a magnetic field. So that's another condition that might be essential as you think about looking at exoplanets. Um, Venus doesn't have much of a magnetic field yet it has retained its atmosphere. So it's not just about the magnetic field, but these are all the important lessons that we need to think about. And, and of course we would wanna look at not just our own planet, but now there's this whole idea of, of alternative Venuses, the different chapters that Venus went through and how they played out so differently than our own planet and, and alternative Mars. Mars is as well. That's a great question. Tim, Tim could I just jump in a second, um, just following up on what Fafita was asking? Um, one of the one of the one of the reasons that Venus went bad could also be um, basically runaway greenhouse due to uh, you know large igneous problems and superimposed 
pulses of large igneous provinces. And there's a paper that we have Michael Way's lead on it that's um, uh, in re-review in, in GRL uh, that basically looks at the chances of stochastically superimposing multiple lips and thus kind of leading yourself to a runaway. So um, while Venus might be on the inner, inner habitable zone, maybe in some ways um, there's also a luck of the draw. And, you know, we sort of also you know, throw out the potential of, of or I don't remember it's in the paper, but the idea that in Earth's future, it's not impossible that a similar stochastic superposition of lips could potentially put us over the edge. So in terms of the space of uh, kind of Venus and, uh, and uh, Earth, like planets, extrasolar planets. Um, it's not just proximity to the sun necessarily that oh, would be not. differentiating in the history. So no, it's and, and the point, and that's right. That, thanks, Richard. That's that's brilliant. And 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 of course, it's not just proximity to the sun. It's about the uh, it's about the greenhouse gas composition. That's so central in all of this. That's part of the very definition of the habitable zone, and and it and has played such a central role in developing and sustaining liquid water at, at our own surface. And so. Um, so this idea of having a very large pulse of volcanic CO2 release in essence, and which has been linked to anoxic events in our own Phanerozoic world, as you know better than I, and extinction events, uh, warming, lower oxygen solubility. And so, so lips, they're a double-edged sword, right? They also give you nutrient delivery. And so Richard, you and I talk about how they, they may have actually generated pulses of oxygenation early in history but led to deoxygenation of the ocean and extinction events. So they may have played very differently in terms of innovation amongst early complex life versus extinction later of, of complex life. So then the question I would say to you as thinking like an exoplanetary scientist is how would you know one of these atmospheres when you, when you see it? And probably part of that would be the levels of CO2 that you see and, and maybe SO2 abundances that would be consistent with very large amounts of volcanic release but those are, again, you know, we're not gonna be seeing volcanoes on these, uh, on these planets. We're not gonna be dropping instruments through the atmospheres like we can on Venus. They're always gonna be 10 light years away and reduced to a few pixels of atmospheric composition. Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, it would be somewhat about the level of CO2. Is it beyond, um, is it a level that means, that would imply that the, um, the, the, the sulfur removal by or through weathering aspect has been broken right so one i'm not sure what whether there's kind of a threshold you can say if co2 abundance and atmospheric pressure is above a certain level does that mean that any kind of yeah, yeah. Um, process of co2 removal through weathering has been broken on, on such exactly. a body and you can run that now we would run that through a range of parameter space so you want to know what's weathering right so do you have exposed continents versus CO2 relationships to seafloor weathering. Um, but you can play with different scenarios and say that if it has this kind of continental configuration, blah, 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 then it would, right, it would be broken or not. That the feedback as we know it could keep up. It depends on the rock type, it depends on a lot of things, but that's what you can model across those different spaces. I just mentioned one other thing about Venus is that there's been a flurry of new missions announced for Venus over the next decade. And, it, and that, so by the end of this decade, we're bound to have so much more information on the surface and the, um, and the atmosphere through the Russian Venera D mission, which will be a lander mission, plus the two NASA missions announced a few weeks ago, Veritas and Da Vinci, one's an orbiter and one drops something through the atmosphere. And then the um, Envision, the European mission has also been announced a week or two ago. And so Venus is gonna be crowded with, with instruments, both in the atmosphere or around the planet, going through the atmosphere and landing on the surface. So it's gonna give us a whole bunch of useful information that will great. obviously Thank help. I did, allude, I did allude to that briefly, but not in that kind of detail. So it is a, uh, it is a very good time to be a Venus uh, scientist. And it's, it's many people would argue it's long overdue. There hasn't been a NASA mission to Venus since what, help me Richard, 89, I think. Early 90s, yeah, the, the Magellan mission, yeah. Right. Finished in about 1994, yeah. It's been a long time. And I think that community really got its ducks in a row um, because of this idea of comparative planetology and the loss of, potential loss of habitability and the lessons to be learned in exoplanet science, the way that ultimately they pitched these missions was brilliant, I think. And I'm, I'm really happy for the results and happy for the community.
Thanks. Hey, Tim. I, uh, I actually wanted to ask you a question myself. Um, sure. Some of the stuff I had been reading recently when I was taking, doing Eddie's class this quarter, uh, relevant to the, the loss of hydrogen to the, to, through, um, through uh, methane photolysis and whatnot. I and mean, you look back at some of the early Catlings and Lee work, they were doing models for, um, for hydrogen loss and relating that to so like the loss of an entire ocean um, from of, of hydrogen worth and and then the the other side of that story is the same you know oxygen that also pumps oxygen into the atmosphere so this uh, potentially could be an abiotic uh, method of oxida oxidizing the atmosphere so well, the first part of that I get that question is you know broadly what do you think of you know, the potential of an abiotic um, method of oxygenizing the early atmosphere? And then the other side of that story is that it's come to the surface more recently with the xenon isotope record and trying to answer the, 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 ze the missing xenon question, I think. And when I look at some of those, uh, some of the more recently produced records of that, um, it's it's weird to me because there's a very steady decrease in the xenon isotope record or a steady trend through to 2.1. Doesn't really seem to recognize the the great oxidation event in the way we see so many other proxies doing. Um, so all in all, uh, I guess what do you think of that? Um, well, I can't I can't say much about the xenon record. You probably know. Okay. I'm sure you know more about it than I do. The idea of hydrogen escape. So that idea of, of losing an ocean's volume worth of water, that gets back to this idea that I said a few minutes ago that there may have been more water um, because we are, we, are, we are losing water and, and hydrogen as a light molecule is, is lost to space. Many, and, and this gets back to this idea of atmospheric retention. It's right, it's about the size of the planet and the, and the size of the molecule that you're interested in losing. And so it's not one set one set of rules fits all, but hydrogen is easily lost from a planet of our size given the lightness of hydrogen. And so, so Kevin Zonley and Mark Clare and, and uh, David Catling have, have long made the point that, that while you might not get massive accumulations of oxygen, and I think that, you know, that Jim Casting and others have modeled this, how, what kind of oxygen buildup you can get from, from o, C, uh, H2O photochemistry. Early in Earth history, there could have been a source of oxygen that way. It's not, it's not a huge flux. Um, it may have been enough to start triggering some other reactions and a sort of cascade of feedbacks, but it's not, it's not very much. And I don't know anyone, including those guys, who don't think that the buildup of oxygen, as we see, that ultimately becomes the GOE is... I don't know anyone who doesn't think that that is related to biological O2 production. That being said, that we are, you know, sort of faced with this idea of, of early oxygen production by biology versus a much later great oxidation event. So it's this idea of sort of oxidizing our planet, right? So that then you're making assumptions about whether the redox state of the mantle has changed and, and, and whether the sink gases like hydrogen that are coming out of that have changed over time the nature of volcanic release from subaerial versus subaqueous, there's been a massive amount of publication on that sink relationship and how that's changed over time and what happened at the GOE. Um, so there's a classic, many of you will know this, but a classic argument that vul volcanism became more subaerial and its ability to the gases and their were more oxidized and their ability to buffer O2 became lower. Again, many, many different arguments, the nature of continents and, and the composition of their continents and, and O2 buffering. That's a long-winded way of saying that you are absolutely right that um, that that loss of water to the atmosphere, the associated photochemistry, and hydrogen escape from the atmosphere is an important part of the process of oxidation of of the Earth's surface environment. Um, but I don't know anyone who thinks that the buildup of O2 in appreciable levels um, is is really explicitly related to that photochemical production of O2. Okay, great, thanks. I actually missed that Hafida had a follow-up from before. Okay. What are your thoughts on... Hmm? Go ahead. What are your thoughts on the idea that Venus has a fossil atmosphere that never evolved? Would that have been possible? I am not, you guys, you, you folks know more about Venus than I do. Richard, you should answer that. A fossil atmosphere that has never evolved. Um, 
that seems hard for me to imagine. <laughs> That's just, just as context, that was, um, there's, um, yeah, it was a talk at the last LPSC, uh, oh. Jim Head and others were talking about okay. um, the level of uh, volcanism required to produce the um, amount of CO2 that we see in the atmosphere and that even with a kind of great magmatic overturn event that might not be sufficient and therefore could this mean that the atmosphere you know that, that, that what we've got is a fossil atmosphere that's been preserved the present atmosphere has been there throughout the history I got um you. so part so of the discussion we had was about um yeah, well whether you know whether you could have had venus and essentially uh prior to some i was at the same session so the same at the same session we talked about could the 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 multiple slip events superimposed that that caused the change have occurred when Venus was already at a sense at a climatic tipping point. So enough CO2 had sort of built up over a potentially longer time and then the little extra pulse from several superimposed Siberian trap scale events would be enough to tip it over. Anyway, that, that was a, so, but there was a, so there was an argument about how much, this, how much uh, volcanism would be required to produce that amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And of course, the big question is how much is of that is being ongoingly recycled into the Earth's interior through maybe an earlier subduction cycle on Venus. So it's 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 a it's a, a lot a lot of unknowns, and hence all the missions because we we, we know a lot less than than we know. <laughs> um, there's a lot more unknown than known, and I so I think you know immediately I'm thinking about the, the sustained steady state of all of that and. And so there's a lot of atmospheric inertia, I would say, with Venus. It has 90 plus bar carbon dioxide. So if, if you're going to tip that some way, it's going to take a pretty serious event to do that. And once you establish that, um, you know, through weathering reactions or otherwise, do, is it hard, you know, how do you get away from that? Um, yeah. Well, I, my I, point was actually more about coming into, that was in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in discussions with Jim, it was about getting into this, yeah. this very stable 90 atmosphere, 90 bar where you've lost you know, you've already lost a lot of water to the atmosphere, so you're in a in a fairly inertial state. But getting into that state, having CO2 having increased somewhat prior to, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a magmatic event, so you've already yeah. built up a fair bit of CO2 in the atmosphere. You still have the problem of trying to balance that against. Well, what's what's the steady state though? What sets it at that level and keeps it from just growing and growing and growing? Or is it? I mean, beyond ninety. Yeah, a, or, or whatever. That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, keep growing. You'd have to it's balance. Really, you'd have to balance it against subduction and, and silicate weathering reactions, which earlier on. But then the present state is there. Is there a limit actually? So if we're at ninety bars now, we're continuing to have volcanism. Yeah. Uh, is it presumably going to continue to increase? Is there a limit on the CO two concentration one gets in an atmosphere well, that has no subduction, no surface erosion, but continued volcanism? Well, and, and, and no water, right? So it's hard to and do no the water. silicate, and there's hard to do the silicate reaction. So I could imagine that it could keep growing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It looks like we've rolled right through 10 a.m. So I think that's probably a good mark to say, let's let's give it a break. Thank you so much, Tim, wow. for everything today. It was my pleasure. It was a really great talk. Thanks for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. Thanks for the great questions. Really great discussion. So, uh, Wishing you all a good week. And again, thanks for the opportunity. Yes, everybody have a good week. And I will, I'll announce the summer schedule very soon. Um, take care till then. Thanks, Alex, for doing this. It's great. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>